to right we're sitting now we're back again we've been pumping them out pretty regularly now man we're doing it man we're doing it this is probably more regular than the first time we did it which is uh isn't saying much but um yeah it's uh it's it's good to be we've been getting you know some great feedback we've been getting some you know some good downloads actually it's good to i think we're slowly people that used to listen to us are starting to figure out that we're back which is good that's a good sign um but yeah, no, it's uh, it, it's been fun. Have you been enjoying yourself? Yeah, man, I've been having a great time. It's really fun uh, talking to smart people again, <laughs> instead of just my dog. One thing um, we need to, we're terrible, and I was terrible at this the first time around, is that if you can subscribe to the podcast on iTunes or whatever it is you're listening to, that, that apparently helps us. And um, if you could write us reviews, I don't know, does Spotify have reviews? I don't know if it has or not, but iTunes definitely mm-hmm, does. Mm-hmm. And iTunes reviews help, apparently. They always have helped, and they still help, according to my uh, my research. So if you could give us, even if you gave us a review on the old feed, this is a new feed, obviously, um, uh, we'd really, really like some some you know people to know we're back um yes yeah so it's uh yeah just give us a review um recommend us to a friend you know whatever and check out the youtube channel too yeah yeah we have a youtube channel go subscribe um we're gonna start posting highlights and then we've got some video stuff some unique video stuff going up there as well which we're about to shoot on wednesdays well we're shooting the first part on wednesday um so Mm -hmm. yeah so you know i come from a filmmaker background so um we'll be you know, utilizing that for sitting now which is exciting but yeah yeah so this week we have uh, a thalamite we have another thalamite on the show we had mr lomolo Duquette a couple of weeks ago and uh i thought well let's keep that going then but in, i think what we've done this week is we've kind of gone over quite thoroughly what philema is and this is kind of like a philema 101 almost episode isn't it really? hmm. yeah i feel like you're maybe trying to uh convert me Possibly get you away from that Spock stuff, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> we have Dr. David Shoemaker on the show today, and anyone in the Thalemic world will will know who who Mr. Shoemaker is. He's a, a clinical psychologist. Um, he's a, from a, he has comes from a uni, Jungian perspective, um, but he's also mm. Uh, an expert on um, all things Philema. He's written a book called Living Philema, which is fantastic. I, I, I recommend highly, if you're interested in any way in Philema, pick this book up. It's it's very affordable, which is quite rare for a magical book, um, but it's also incredibly <laughs> well written um, and it covers a... It just, it's basically like a, you know, how to be a Thelemite book, and it's it's fantastic. Um, he also wrote a book called The Winds of Wisdom, which is another favourite of mine, which, which is... Um, his experience is scrying the Enochian ethers, and we t- we talked to him about these things uh, in the interview. But uh, yeah, he's um, you know a very knowledgeable man, and I'm really excited to talk to him. I really enjoy. I mean, he's he's a. Uh, I like that he comes from a psychological background. That he's going to be able to give us a kind of perspective uh, that's more down to earth, maybe than other people. Yeah, definitely. And you know, he's uh, he's friends with one of our. Or a friend of the show, Lomo Dequette. So that's that's obviously a good sign, as far as I'm concerned. Who isn't? You know, that Lon is like everybody's pal, huh? Yeah, he's great. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, let's cut to the show now with Doctor David Shoemaker. Hey, David Shoemaker, welcome to the show. Um, I was wondering if you could give us a brief biography of yourself, please. I sure will. Thanks very much for having me. I appreciate it. Um, so I'm a clinical psychologist by training. i uh, been in practice for 25, 30 years at this point. Uh, but I got into the uh, the world of Thelema and ceremonial magic um, when I was in my 20s in graduate school. And uh, since that time, I've 
been working extensively in uh, the Thelemic organizations known as Ordo Templi Orientis and AA. Also, um, presently the, the Chancellor and Prolocutor, that is the, the head of the order of uh, the order called the Temple of the Silver Star, which is a Thelemic organization founded on some of the principles of the Hermetic Order, the Golden Dawn, but brought into uh, accord with Thelema. And that's a lot of my everyday life is uh, devoted to uh, administrating um, that organization and uh, and others and uh, teaching and writing, um, including uh, the Living Thelema book and podcast and uh, a few other uh, books that I've edited or uh, or written over the years. I talk to you about Living Thelema and also uh, the book you wrote called The Winds of Wisdom, which is um, yes. something uh, I'm very interested in as well. You keep mentioning Thelema. I really am not super sure on what Thelema is. Could you ex- explain it to us briefly? Sure. So Thelema is the philosophy and for some a uh, religion that was founded by Aleister Crowley in the early part of the 20th century. The uh, The basic tenet is, uh, of Thelema is that um, we each have an appointed purpose uh, in our incarnate lives. And this is called the true will. This is not a singular task to accomplish, but a basic nature. It is uh, the our our essential nature as a human being, as an expression of universal will. So the individual life is lived out ideally in a way that is in harmony with this true will, and in doing so. By, by attempting to discover this this true will and live it out, uh, we have the best hope possible to live a harmonious life with with others, and most importantly, in accord with what the universe sort of wants us to do. You know, we have certain skills and, and aptitudes, and service has a gift to bring the world. Uh, and if we can do our best to discover that and bring it, uh, that is not only our our own individual best shot at uh, maximizing our potential but also humanity's best shot at having uh, itself evolve because each person ideally is doing this work individually and trying to contribute to society accordingly so that's the lima in a nutshell uh you mentioned the yeah you mentioned the true will um and that's something that i've seen comes up a lot um i mean what the main the 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 main uh, slogan I always hear is "Do what thou wilt." Right? Can you explain what the will is? What "Do what thou wilt" is? Certainly, um, and this folds in with with everything I was just saying. The true will is not the simple whims or desires of the personality at the ego level. The true will is the will of the innermost self. The that that uh, basic nature that, that I was just describing. The, the um, personalized expression of universal will so you could think of it as um i'm a jungian psychologist so uh, in, in in jungian terminology this is the the will of the true self with the capital s uh as opposed to the the uh, everyday ego self that we walk around the world in so it's it's the opposite of do whatever you want do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law means that our task the law of the lima is to try to live in accordance with that deeper will that is um, our essential nature and not be distracted or drawn into uh, or primarily immersed in the simple wants and needs of the personality. So do what thou wilt doesn't mean do whatever you want to do. Exactly. As, and Curly would often emphasize that it's it's almost the opposite of that <laughs> because sometimes what our what our true calling is what our true nature is uh is something that the personality may rail against at times we may feel uncomfortably challenged by trying to live up to who we really are mm-hmm. um, and wrestle against that you know and the ego has all kinds of ways of uh, of tricking us and uh, and distracting us uh so go ahead so the answer, obviously, to do what thou will should be the whole of the law is love is the law, love and the will. I was wondering if you could maybe discuss that mm-hmm. section of it as well. Yeah, these are the traditional Thelemic uh, uh, greeting and closing. Do what thou will as a greeting and love is the law, love under will as a closing. So um, Crowley describes love is the law, love under will as a statement of 
the fact that love broadly understood, not merely in the, the human, the sense of human love that we normally think of, uh, love broadly understood is the binding force of the universe that the universe uh has a tendency to want to draw together passionately you know and and the universe meaning all of us all our consciousness all of all of nature um and that what is impelling that pulling together uh the binding force is will so love under will uh, i you could almost um paraphrase that as love powered by will or love under the uh, momentum of will or something like that. Um, and, uh, within that definition of love, it, it's also understood that, uh, we include things like human love and, and, uh, the way we normally think of it. But Crowley also talked about hate as a version of love in the sense that it's also a smashing together of two things. The difference is, how we label it and how we feel about it as it's happening. So, you know, two people fighting are smashing into each other in anger, but two people, uh, making love are smashing into each other in an entirely different way. So that's kind of a side point, but it's one I like to point out. Um, when it comes to, um, being a thalamite, and this is something you've written about in your book, um, uh, living Thelema, um, there's, various kind of practices that um a fellow might is kind of advised to um you know to to, to go mm -hmm. through um like i was wondering if you could talk about some of the kind of you know if someone was considering thelema as a as, as a practice like what kind of um activities essentially would they be kind of um not you know not required to do but you know suggested to do sure sure um well you know many of the fundamental practices of Thelema are uh, either directly or indirectly drawn from the practices of the, the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn that Alistair Crowley was originally trained in. So, for example, um, the lesser ritual of the pentagram uh, is, or its adaptation uh, and Crowley's later uh, version of the pentagram ritual called the Star Ruby. These are designed to be daily I like to think of it as hygienic, magically hygienic rituals to be done on a regular basis. Um, then uh, there is a set of solar adorations called Liber Resh, Bill Helios. And I did a podcast episode on, on that as well as the pentagram ritual early on. And um, these solar adorations are uh, inspired. I think Crowley was originally inspired by, for example, the, the, uh, the multiple daily prayers of Muslims, and they're directed toward the sun uh, at four times a day corresponding to the stations of the sun. Then there's a practice called will, which is basically a simple verbal ceremony of mindfulness at the main meal of the day. Uh, Crowley was calling it will as opposed to grace, <laughs> I suppose. Um, and uh, the... Uh, you know, Crowley had a prolific uh, career as a writer, as, as anyone who's encountered him knows, um, sometimes more prolific uh, than perhaps he should have been. But uh, he uh, he wrote dozens of instructional rituals and texts um, that could be optionally adopted by a practitioner. And in the training system of AA and Temple of the Silver Star and others, um, these are assigned typically in a staged way to uh, get someone moving through the initiatory degrees and such. But the pentagram ritual and Libresh and will, uh, I would say are your, your foundational practices. Like, um, in my experience, when people are sort of recommended to do these things, they think, Oh, they're kind of, they're not kind of powerful, you know, magical rituals, but that's not been my experience personally. I don't know if you could talk to that a little bit. I think there is a kind of, um, I think if, do you think there's a kind of, uh, there's something to be said for, maintaining a discipline essentially of doing these things each day and um and yes they, they certainly have they see they certainly appear to have a, a, a an actual tangible kind of effect don't they <laughs> oh yes <laughs> um and there there's so many reasons that these are and i use the word foundational on purpose you know that these these rituals like for example the pentagram ritual are um are foundational in the sense that they become the foundation for everything you build on top of that. And of course, we're going to move on. If someone's a committed ceremonialist, we're going to move on to more advanced rituals and such. But let's look at what 
the pentagram ritual does if you adopt it as a daily practice. One, you've already mentioned the self-discipline. Uh, unless you have self-discipline to do something simple, how are you going to have self-discipline to do something complex across your lifetime? You know, if you can't hold your attention, same same applies to basic yoga practices. If you can't hold your attention to an image for a set number of minutes, an image in your mind, or if you you know you can't keep your focus on a a ritual action as simple as the pentagram ritual, uh, you don't have much hope of of keeping your will focused for something more complicated. So you, there's a self-discipline aspect, the mental focus aspect, the magical hygienic effect that I was speaking of earlier. It, could, it is said the wisdom teaching around the pentagram ritual is that it cleanses the the body of light and uh, keeps it free of unwanted influence from uh, whatever you know in the psychic and magical environment of the initiate. Um, so it's protective and and uh, power generating in that sense. The ritual contains points of contact with the uh, the four so-called archangels who are said to be set uh, to to guard humanity and the, the person and the and the uh, functions of the four elements. And uh, energetically speaking, and this is my last point about the pentagram ritual and why it's so important. Energetically speaking, by doing a ritual like this on a regular basis and watching and experiencing and putting in your diary, importantly, what is happening to you? What are you feeling? What are you visualizing? What is the nature of, say, an elemental archangel? What is it like to feel yourself uh, and try to configure yourself as the center of the universe, uh, uh, balanced in those four elements? You know, those are insights into our personal energetic management that if we don't have those, we're not going to be able to most efficiently go on to more advanced ritual. You can always pick up a, a grimoire, whatever, and maybe get some results out of it, even if you're completely unexperienced. But um, the trained, disciplined magician who has gone through a phase of these foundational practices is going to be much better set up to get the most out of any working that they do. Yeah, definitely. I, I've, um, I was diagnosed with ADHD. Uh, I sort of figured I'd, I knew I had it for a long time. And um, I found as as part of my kind of ADHD therapy, I started to mm -hmm. like really reincorporate um, those foundational, um, you know, practices. But because I'd sort of slacked off a little bit, to be if I'm being honest. But I think that might have been because of the ADHD, actually. But um, anyway, as part of the kind of therapy, I started, I sort of you know really sort of uh plugged back into doing that every single day and i actually found it was sure. not only useful kind of magically but it was also useful psychologically as well for the you know for, right. for the uh you know to help me kind of build a kind of mental mental stamina as it were to kind of uh exactly yes yeah and i think yeah so it's definitely i mean this is something i always i, I was always told and now i always tell people now is that you have to do that stuff every day and really kind of do it with intent <laughs> as it were i think i think that's quite important as a psychologist you are a psychologist so as a psychologist um how how do these rituals affect you in a more psychological way and less of like a spiritual way or more like you know just just a less ritual description of something and more of a down-to-earth like is this going to make me smarter is it going to make me <laughs> more emotionally stable you know <laughs> right right um I don't know about smarter, but in a sense, yes. Damn. <laughs> uh, actually, I, that's that's a good point. You know, in many many ways of understanding intelligence, we probably do get smarter. But basically, uh, for example, a, a simple daily hygienic practice is what we might call a, a meditative practice, and that it's kind of a moving meditation uh, where we keep our mind focused on something. And that is, there's tons of evidence and, and research on the physiological and mental benefits of a daily uh, you know meditative or relaxation practice so that by itself is is a, a step in the right direction for people in terms of their psychological benefit of it uh, after training people in these traditions for 25 or so years i've certainly seen people um, report and come across as more balanced and calm 
And most rewardingly, as a, as a teacher, you know, seeing people increasingly feeling like they are uh, living out their lives in a way that is in harmony for them, that is, that they seem more themselves. They're living themselves out in fullness, maximizing their potential and seeming to be more satisfied with their lives uh, because they're refining their ability to make choices in accordance with true will. And the basic ritual regimen has allowed them some space to uh, discover more about themselves, their energetic patterns, their, their mental and emotional patterns, discovering blind spots uh, about how they treat people or interact with people, discovering psychological projections onto people and trying to keep those in check. Um, and uh, just generally, uh, as I say, kind of becoming more themselves and, uh, and maximizing their potential. So it's almost like a way of... Um... I guess like refining who you are through through ritual. I'd say it's the ritual as a tool, and 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 the diary keeping and the self discipline of it all uh, that uh, refines our ability to discover who we are and clear away mm, the mud, you know, the mud of expectation and of. Uh, self-delusion that uh, that often clouds who we are i've always kind of wondered about this um what what do you think is the actual mechanism behind uh, a ritual having a direct effect on your mind like that well you know i can imagine different disciplines speaking to that in different ways i mean i as a psychologist i typically uh look at a psychological worldview as as one of my go-to explanations but that doesn't set aside a a truly purely i guess in quotes magical worldview where um we are clearing away the the influence of energies or entities that tend to distract us or attempt to um subvert you know our energy in some way from a psychological perspective i think a ritual is Focusing the mind uh, on a, a a particular aim, which may be I'm I'm going to do this pentagram ritual, but in in enacting self discipline that that requires, we are in essence training ourselves to focus. You know, it is a yoga practice mm -hmm. in essence, where we are in each step, whether we're drawing a pentagram or vibrating the name of a deity or whatever it is. We are throwing all of ourselves into that moment, and you know that's that's yoga, and that is training our mind to not be distracted and to uh, keep itself focused. And and that tool, that sort of um, ability to to sustain attention on something, is what takes us anywhere we ever go in life. Because without that, we're we're spinning our wheels. Yeah, that's really it's really weird. Um to think like i don't know how to put this it's just really interesting to think that on the outside this looks like a sort of search for power but really it's it's more of a way to ch to have change on like power over yourself right and affect change within your within yourself that's right and then when when that is translated into change over our surrounding circumstances you know that when when we do adopt an intention to perform a ritual for some sort of outer change we have hopefully done it from a place of self-understanding that is uh, a place of um, connection to true will so that the the goal that we have is something that is in line with the true will that's why as we discover our true will more concretely and specifically we are able to be more powerful in enacting it but that power is only applied if applied wisely is only applied in ways that are in harmony with the true will so it is um like we're swimming with the current you know instead of against it um one thing that kind of crops up a lot in when you read about crowley and you read about the ato and the aa is um the holy guardian angel Yes. Uh, I was wondering if you could talk about uh, this is something that obviously also seems to credit seems to have pulled from the Golden Dawn. 
uh, or, or at least his time in the Golden Dawn. Um, could you talk mm-hmm. about the, the Holy Guardian Angel and why this is like such an important aspect of of the you know the philemic uh, pathway kind of thing? Sure. Um, so the Holy Guardian Angel is Crowley's term for that uh, deepest self or that. Uh, external entity as he sometimes conceived of it that is in many senses like a personal god that we must get in touch with in order to be fully aware of our true will Uh, Crowley picked that term he said because he knew it was ridiculous in a sense (laughs) you know that this idea of a a guardian angel uh, he, he didn't want it to be he he wanted the term to be kind of silly enough so that people wouldn't build too many doctrines around it of course that happens anyway but uh the the basic idea was that uh, there is a state of spiritual awakening that we can understand as being a, a a union and communication between the the ego of the adept and that super rational um transpersonal entity that is our link to the divine so again a psychologically minded interpretation might be this is our higher self but and at times Crowley seemed to lean in that direction in some communications with students and so on at other times he was emphatic that it was an external entity and uh the good news is that if you follow the path of AA um, or Temple of the Silver Star and, and training systems that are designed to lead toward knowledge or conversation, uh, you don't have to know in advance what anything like this is. You will discover it, and it won't matter whether you read in a book that it was your higher self or an external entity. You'll know what it is for you. Um, and there are milestones that could be trained and tested along the way to give people you know, a leg up toward toward that discovery so um basically the the so-called knowledge and conversation of the holy guardian angel is that state of uh conscious communication and bonding between adept and angel i think that um i think often gets a bit mixed up with when people look into this stuff is um they look at they hear the holy guardian angel and then for some reason i often see this getting confused quite a lot is um the difference between the holy guardian angel and the secret chiefs that you hear about um Mm -hmm. so to me they they're quite clearly very different things but um could you perhaps explain because secret chiefs is a thing again that um we heard about with you know with Crowley's time in the in the golden dawn and obviously mathers and co and um uh and also later on he talks about it in regards to the aa and the um and the and the oto i was wondering could you talk about what the secret chiefs are and what you know sure what, what or who they are kind of thing <laughs> sure uh well uh, you know originally um Crowley's exposure to this as you said this concept would have been in the in the golden dawn and when the golden dawn was supposedly founded by its human founders uh, being in contact with the so-called secret chiefs who are sometimes conceived of as these discarnate, you know, uh, influencers <laughs> and sometimes, um, seen as, uh, living adepts who are simply operating at a distance, uh, and, and less visible. Uh, but he took this idea and I guess one way of putting it is that he, he made it more of a, uh, he can, he began to conceive of it more as a reality of the path of initiation itself, where when you rise up to a certain level of exalted consciousness, you are in touch with a level of universal mind that is truly uh, guiding humanity's evolution. And one way of talking or thinking about that would be the secret chiefs in quotes who are um, um, you know, behind the behind that evolution and impelling it. Um, so, it, in Crowley's case specifically, his own holy guardian angel kind of took on that that role. Um, his 
uh, Holy Guardian Angel Iwas, which was the entity which supposedly dictated to him the Book of the Law, um, which we haven't touched on specifically, but in 1904 he had this experience of having this book dictated to him. Uh, that's his story. About that, shouldn't we? That's quite important. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, the Book of the Law. Yeah, yeah that thing. Uh, <laughs> uh, and... Uh, in, in his case, uh, Iwas was seen as not not only his holy guardian angel, but just so happened to be the uh, the harbinger, the uh, the messenger of the whole new aeon itself, um, and the 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 aeon of Horus, uh, where um, certain new energies were going to be overthrowing the old, and and so on. And uh, that's another part of Crowley's personal mythos, of course. But um, so I guess my main point there is that his, in his case, the Holy Guardian Angel, just to grossly oversimplify things, his Holy Guardian Angel happened to be one of the secret chiefs. Not everyone's is, uh, according to the theory. Uh, I, I, guess, <laughs> I guess we touched on it, uh, so we should probably talk about it, really. Uh, <laughs> um, it's, it kind of uh, it's completely slipped my mind to bring that up probably quite near the beginning of the interview really which is the book of the law um so yeah i mean the book of the law is kind of a keystone in a way of the uh of the philemic you know practice um can right. we, can we talk about yeah quickly how it was received and why it is you know held it as such an important uh book to a fellow knight sure so uh in 1904 crowley and his wife rose were honeymooning in cairo and they uh spent the night uh oversimplifying a bit of course but the, the through a sequence th- sequence of events <laughs> they uh spent the night in the great pyramid and uh, had a um uh a series of encounters over the course of three days where crowley was instructed to sit down and take dictation and his account of it is that at the appointed time a voice started talking and he wrote it down and um uh, so these three days uh, of dictations became the three chapters of the book of the law, which, uh, Crowley grappled with for a while and kind of tried to figure out how to, what to make of it, wrote some commentaries and, and, uh, eventually came to see the book of the law as the central holy text of the new dispensation, uh, religious dispensation of Thelema. And it was going to be, um, embodied in the, the idea of the, uh, Egyptian god Rahurquit, the god of force and fire, uh, overturning the uh, sort of the Christian era of Aeon of Osiris. Um, and so this involved ideas like uh, getting past the idea that in order to be spiritually whole, you had to be saved by an external redeemer. Um, the idea of that so-called dying god formula where as a as a formula of myth and ritual where you know we're we're redeemed by jesus or some version of that you know um and his idea was that he was uh, the prophet of this new dispensation uh and um the book of the law was the central holy text so that's that's it in a nutshell so is is um like who is iowas then right like is that how you say iowas who who is that then, right? If it was an external being, why was Crowley's holy guardian angel the one, like you know, the secret chief? Is it just coincidence? I mean, yeah, it's weird. It's a weird thing to me. Yeah, um, I, I guess one way to think of it is um, if <laughs> I'm going to take an entirely pragmatic point of view for a second, and that is if 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 you're on a path of self-discovery and your task is to make sense of your universe and you come to believe that you have a, a certain mission in, in the world and you have this ecstatic uh, awakened contact with, with an external being as, as it is perceived. Mm-hmm. Um, it's going to be pretty natural that that being uh, is the thing that defines your whole universe and puts you at the center of it. <laughs> so, mm, yeah. uh, you know, if you're going to start a religion, uh, I guess you know you want to have uh, your HDA be also the uh, the uh, calling card of the whole religion. But that's that's kind of a cynical, pragmatic point on purpose. For sure, yeah. But <laughs> but I kind of um I, I guess what I'm getting at is if everybody's going after their own holy guardian angel, shouldn't we also be looking for our own book of the law dictation? 
You know, it, that's a really good way of putting that. I think in many ways, yes, you know, it, 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 it is incumbent on all of us if we're on this path to discover our central truth and find a way eventually to translate that into um, a manifest reality for the world. And, you know, we could, if we think of the book of the law, especially metaphorically as being, uh, you know, the, the, the encapsulation of our, of our vision of what the world is about and what our place in it is and, you know, how, how we can evolve as a species, then each of us does get a book of the law if we uh, get our own version of that, if we stick with the path. Um, for some, that might be literally a book. For others, that might be, um, uh, you know, simply attaining a, a, a high degree of competence at their expressed uh, will in the sense of a, a career or a creative uh, work or whatever it is for them. But, uh, yeah, I, I like that metaphor. Um, one thing I really like about in your book, uh, Living to Lima, is you talk about kind of life outside the temple. Um, right. Um, how, in terms of like, you know, uh, if you say, let's say you've been a member of the ATO or you've been, you've been a member of the AA for a while, how does that kind of affect you socially, you know, rather than, uh, rather than within your sort of circle of philemic friends? How does it, how do you feel that it, it can kind of have an effect on you with non practitioners, you know, um, yeah is there a tangible you know is there something that you've you've seen or recorded or you know i think this falls in in a similar category to what we we're talking about earlier with the psychological changes that i note in people um when we are more self-aware especially aware of our weaknesses and our blind spots we tend to do a better job of uh interacting with humans <laughs> because we are uh you know not projecting so much of that stuff onto other people um in an effort to sustain our blindness <laughs> and uh, comfort uh, so i think i i find that thelemites that um stick with this work and are really dedicated to the daily practice um it, just to put sort of bluntly, um, become better people, better friends, better partners, because they are more, more humble in the right kind of way. You know, they're aware of, as I said, their their weaknesses and their blind spots and so on. So um, I think uh, there's a, a greater sense in these people of uh, social responsibility and how to truly care for each other in a way that honors each other's truth. And I guess that that's an important point about the true will doctrine that I wanted to make, um, since I just thought of it is that the doctrine and the practice implies that not only are we seeking to live out our own true will, but that we're seeking to give other people maximum freedom to do the same. So mm. it is a philosophy and a practice that, that holds at its center the personal liberty of each person to discover who they are. And, and we try to uphold that for others just as much as we do for ourselves. Could you say in a way that in a way we live in a philemic society then in some ways, like uh, currently in the West, at least that it, mm -hmm. feel, it feels like it, the world's gone a lot more philemic generally, generally yes. speaking. Um, <laughs> yeah. I, I, I would say if, if Crowley popped up uh, alive today, he would, he would, probably say that a lot of the changes socially and culturally we've seen uh, in the last century since the uh, Book of the Law came along uh, were a, a fulfillment of what he was envisioning as the, the thelemic current taking hold. For example, greater personal liberties and greater uh, sexual freedoms and things like that. Now, I know in today's climate, uh, when so many things seem pretty screwed up, <laughs> it's hard to look at that and go, oh, look, look how much we're evolving. But I think if, uh, if we really take that in the context of the systemic uh, lack of freedom that has been so, so prominent for a couple thousand years, and especially that sort of inner freedom of thought and of belief and of um, personal expression, uh, I, I think we can clearly see Thelema happening, you know? Mm. It feels like magic generally is less of a taboo subject these days. It felt that's you, true, also. Yeah, you read 
like you know accounts of people being ostracized quite badly you know for being involved with the occult you know not so even so long ago you know maybe back in like the 50s 40s that sort of thing. yes um so and you still see that it you still see that in in some areas in the u.s for example in smaller communities that are more conservative it's harder to be out as a as a magician or maybe even impossible to to be out if you're going to keep your job you know so unfortunately that's mm-hmm. still true somewhere but i think in general it's uh it's improving you know i have a question um and this kind of falls uh, this is something i was bugging uh lon milo to about when he was on uh do you feel that you're a psychologist too so i know i keep bringing this up but <laughs> i feel like you have you're in a special spot uh to have an opinion about this do you think that magic is something happening inside or outside of a person do you know what i mean like do it the way i said to lon and i don't know if it got it cross right but was that uh like i feel like i can do magic that changes me but i can't do magic that's going to make uh a, a, a tornado show up Mm-hmm. Right. Um, my experience in myself and in the experience of my students over this time um, suggests to me that it is possible to make inner changes that correspond to outer changes, that that um, influence the likelihood of outer changes happening that correspond to our inner changes. This is the whole doctrine of as above, so below, or the, the microcosm, microcosm of the magician in relation to the macrocosm of the world around. And, the, you know, the, the basic theory is that because there is a correspondence between these things, inner changes are mirrored in outer changes and, and to some extent vice versa. Now, the extent to which this is possible in, uh, utterly observably macrocosmic ways like causing a thunderstorm or something like that. I think uh, Mm. we have to be careful about those conclusions, but uh, I have seen and felt and talked with people about um, enough uncanny uh, happenings, you know, as a result of a ritual that I, that I'm certainly not going to say that's impossible. Um, uh, I think the work is fundamentally inward in that for so much of the, especially the initial phases, we are refining our knowledge of the true will. So that is more introverted if you want to think of it that way. But eventually when, when knowledge and conversation occurs, the task of the adept becomes one of uh, extroversion to, to build a life where that will can live itself out fully And so in that sense, it becomes much more about operation on the external world. Um, If you think about the true will doctrine, and I think this impinges on your question of inner versus outer, uh, the true will doctrine implies that if we're in harmony with it, if we're in possession of that awareness of our true will, our choices about, say, a magical ritual will be in accord with the flow of the universe. So it's more likely, therefore, that if what we want as a change process is is big and macrocosmic. It's going to be in line with what the universe is already doing. Mm. And we're sort of assisting in the cause, you know. <laughs> That's we're, interesting. We're one of the proximate causes of the, the thunderstorm. Uh, but uh, uh, that's just a, a point that may be fairly important. Well, one thing um, that I'm interested to talk to you about, uh, which you've written a whole book about, that seems to deal with this somewhat, is uh, The Winds of Wisdom. Mm-hmm. And, and Enochian and the Enochian system of magic. Could you? I mean, let's, let's not go too deep into kind of because we could spend hours talking about the kind of history, <laughs> history of uh, John Dee right. and uh, Kelly. And um, but I was wondering, could you tell us about your kind of process and like you know what drew you to the to do the Enochian um, uh, system and like kind of how you went about it and the kind of results you got because you're one of the very few people. Uh, that seems to actually write about their results. <laughs> right. I, the <laughs> Funny majority, that. Yeah, it's weird. It's, uh, we spoke to Lon about this, and he said that he thinks that most people are just too scared to write about failure because often <laughs> a, lot, a, lot, a lot of magic is failure, isn't it? You know, you fail until you, sure. you don't fail. And uh, sure. um, 
but you, you've actually written a full account of your um you know of what you did and what happened and um that that's kind of fascinating to me and that's kind of the kind of magical text i like i drink up i love it <laughs> so i was wondering if you could uh talk uh, you know to to this whole experience that'd be great sure so uh just quickly, the, the Enochian system of the 30 Aethers is one of the components uh, uh, that Dean Kelly uh, derived. And so around 2007 or so, I undertook as a, as a personal working to scry, that is, obtain visions of each of these 30 astral realms known as the Aethers. And uh, the entire transcript of my experiences is what went into the, the book, The Winds of Wisdom. Um this was as it, as it was with with I'm not directly comparing the you know, quality of visions or whatever to what Crowley got, but as it was with Crowley in his vision and the voice um, recordings of his his visions, um, it was an initiatory experience uh, in every sense. Uh, I, as I went from Aether to Aether, I was clearly given um, sometimes coded but but definite uh instructions on what had to be done in order to proceed to the next and sometimes unwittingly i would have every intention of uh, moving on to the next vision the next night or something like that but inexplicably it would be six months before i came back to it and then i would discover on reflection that uh, there were some things i had to go and do in my life uh, inwardly or outwardly first before the next vision was was open to me so uh those kinds of experiences are initiatory in the sense that you have to level up before you can um, really move on so finally in 2011 or so i finished the the last of the visions and uh, a few years later decided it was it was a good idea to um, to publish this along with the the methodology that i used so someone can pick up the winds of wisdom and as long as you have uh, some images of the so-called reformed tablets of Raphael. Um, you can every, uh, everything else you need is is in the book in terms of the uh, the procedures and the names to to uh, vibrate and so on. So that's that's the winds of wisdom. It's the fruit of those visions. So, um, could you talk to a little bit about the actual visions you received? Maybe some of the more um the more potent ones sure um one of the the hallmarks of these kinds of things that for me is kind of a self check against delusion or you know just sort of seeing what i want to see and so on is that it, it the material that came through had an interconnectedness and a, sort of a, a unity of of purpose i guess that was well beyond my conscious capacity to construct so there's no way i i could have consciously sort of come up with these ideas or had them uh in the back of my mind and just uh you know force fit them into some sort of fantasy vision i was getting um interconnectedness in terms of the uh the symbol sets and the Gematria values of words that I hadn't previously known, and it just interlocked in a way that was uh, proof for me that there was something of, if if not of value to anyone else, at least of, of value to me as a communication about some truths that were outside my everyday consciousness. And um, so, uh, some of these materials, um, as as you would expect and possibly hope, have found their way into the training systems that i administer um where where it seems appropriate you know if i feel like i've discovered something that's of, of utility um and uh yeah so it's it's uh it, it was it was quite an experience in in ways that uh, surprised even me yeah i think one of the kind of misconceptions perhaps about enochian magic is that you have to build a table you have to you know there's a quite a lot of elaborate uh set dressing right. almost as it were um that is you know if you read say for example lon's book he talks about the table and the, the right. tablet and um do you think it, it it definitely seems that there is a way of still doing the system without i mean crody wouldn't have taken for example a table to the algiers with him would he <laughs> um, right, right. To, to, yeah so um could you talk a bit about you know perhaps 
you know, the, the fact that you can kind of slightly alter the system, as it were, to, and still get, you know, tangible results. Yeah, well, one thing you're getting at there is that there are different uh, components of the system and the, the work with the holy table and all the the sigils, uh, wax tablet and all of that is a different uh, corner of the Enochian system. But the, the Aether Scryings, um, as you point out, even as Crowley did them, are really pretty minimal. Um, you know, he had a, a scrying stone. It was a topaz set in a cross, and he, he would uh, focus on that to start the vision. But uh, you don't even necessarily need that if you're if you can do a good job of scrying simply from inner awareness, which is generally what I did. Um, not saying that's better. I'm just saying different people have different tools that get them there. You know, it might mm. be a crystal or a bowl of water or something like that. Uh, I had one Black guy Beard. that used a, an iPhone screen randomly as a as a scrying mirror. Um, sure. Was, <laughs> I guess you know whatever works. I like that. I like that. <laughs> Bootstrapping. Um, yeah, it doesn't matter that I, in many ways, in many aspects of magic, the uh, the materials and the um, what I want to say, you know, the, the 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 tools used are much less important than the results gained, and you, you know, measuring measuring success by the results, by the fruits of the work, you know, rather than did I draw that sigil just right. Uh, you know, I think precision is important, but uh, sometimes we get fantastic results from the most basic of materials. And I know folks like Lon have written and thought a lot about uh, about that truth. Would you? Say, what would you say is the reason that? Um, because I was talking to, like I said earlier, I was talking to Lon about this, um, and I talk about this a lot because basically um, I was looking for accounts of people's, you know, what happened when people did ritual, essentially, um, mm-hmm. and. It's very different. I mean, it was. It's a very slim list of books that I have actually that actually talk about it. Out, you know, outside of Crowley, obviously, he was. You know, spoke at, at length about um, these mm-hmm. results. Uh, but I mean, there's Lon's My Life of the Spirits, like David Conway's, um, in, you know, Magical Primer book. Um, but the, the, really, I mean, it's very, very hard to get hold of people's, you know, records essentially of what happened. And uh, you know, why mm-hmm. do you think that is? Do you think it's what Lon said? It's a fear of failure, maybe, or well, sure. I'm I'm sure that's in there for a, a lot of people. Um, fear of failure. I can. I'll just list the obstacles I can think of off the top of my head. Uh, fear of failure, or a, a fear of coming across as uh, egotistical for even having a presumption of publishing your your uh, memoir or something like that. Um, fear of coming across as self-important. Um, fear of exposure. Uh, uh, in the sense that uh, people will think this is stupid, or they'll they'll mm. think I'm a fraud, or whatever. Um, so you know, all kinds of sort of ego based fear stuff there. Mm. Um, also, you know, maybe it's just it's there's kind of a critical mass of more as more people do that and begin to appreciate the value of seeing those insights for any human. You know, uh, maybe it'll happen more. Um, I think, uh, you know, I, I have had the great pleasure and, and privilege in my life to review people's diaries in AA and Temple of the Silver Star for about 25 years now. And I've seen so much good record keeping that someday may be a body of knowledge that um, that helps all of us. And of course, that's the, the one of the main purposes of keeping a magical diary to begin with is that we have this quasi-scientific record of what we tried and what worked and what screwed up and uh so maybe maybe there'll be more of that out there in the future publicly i I think it's you know it's uh, i wouldn't see it as an ego thing personally i'd see it as a useful you know i think it's you know almost emotionally useful to see other people actually doing the work and you know getting results or not getting results and you know i I think that, that personally that's quite an important thing that's what something i always found like really fascinating with Crowley's writings was the fact that he would you know put pen to paper and actually um you know say this is what happened you know it's, it's kind of there's right. a kind of, there's a kind of a educational use in it but also a kind of a kind of comfort in it strangely i don't know why maybe right. it's just, maybe it's just me well it makes you 
it makes you not feel like you're mentally ill, right? <laughs> yeah, <I guess> so. <laughs> I, I, mean, I remember reading one, uh, mm. it, was, it was a PDF that went round, um, you possibly heard of it, uh, called The Black Lodge of Santa Cruz. And that was one of the ones yeah. where the, the uh, I think it was Frater Satir, and he, uh, but he spoke at length about the results of what happened. He was scrying the ethers as well, I think. And um, it was it was fascinating. And, and it was really interesting to see how this magical operation, A, the results he got, but also the effect it had on his yeah. life outside of the, you know, the ritual. And I, I found that quite, although it's quite a controversial text, I found it quite, you know, educational and quite comforting. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, what this discussion of reading other people's diaries called to mind an experience I had, um, uh, fairly early in my training where I was, I was, um, I was reading some of Crowley's diaries and, uh, feeling highly inadequate, you know, about my, my own diary recording and just kind of beating myself up for, you know, oh man, I could, you know, how am I going to ever make any progress? I could never be that good or whatever. Uh, and, uh, the next thing I read was in, um, a master of the temple, which is, uh, Frater Ahad's magical diary, where Frater Ahad is beating himself up, having read some of Crowley's diaries, and Crowley's there saying, "Now stop that," you know. <laughs> so uh, I encountered, uh, you know, another initiate's own encounter with self-esteem, uh, magical self-esteem issues based on reading diaries. Uh, so I think we we could all use a confidence boost in that regard. Yeah. One thing, I mean, we haven't really kind of gone over it particularly, but I'd love to talk to you, you know, briefly about it and maybe at length in another episode. But um, obviously, you're outside of magic, although you could say they're kind of interlinked. You're fascinated with Carl Jung. Um, yes. I was wondering, I was wondering how, because they seem like two things that snap together quite nicely, uh, which is, you know, Jungian psychology and, and, and magic, <laughs> essentially. Uh, could you talk a little bit about Jung? But also... Could we talk a little bit about he had his own kind of mystical experiences? And I think that's, yeah. that's something that would be interesting to our to our listeners. Yeah, that, oh, I have a lot to say about that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> first of all, I, Jung was was kind of my gateway drug into magic to begin with. I, I was deeply into Jung uh, initially, even as a, a, a teenager. But um, really, once I got into psychology and knew that was going to be my, my life's work, um, I explored it more and it, it appealed to me as a a worldview that had more room for all the mystery that is in the, the, the mind, you know, and in life. But through Jung, I encountered uh, Israel Regardi and his middle pillar book specifically. And in that book, he's specifically talking about the overlap between Kabbalistic psychology and the Jungian model of consciousness. And that's what clued me into Crowley reading Regardi. Uh, so really, the 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 Jungian, as I said, the Jungian uh, work was a, a gateway into magic for me originally, and, and directly into Thelema. Um, but Jung's uh, mystical experiences, I, I wasn't even fully aware of at the time, because of course the record of those, called the Red Book, wasn't published until many years later. Um, and uh, what fascinates me about the Red Book now that we've thankfully got it uh, to read. Is uh, which, which is a gloriously, uh, you know, illuminated manuscript in the medieval style that in Jung's own uh, Jung's own art and uh, writings. It is the closest we have from from Jung of a record of his own holy guardian angel contact. You know, and 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 uh, it's a magical diary in many senses that uh, was exactly what we would hope a knowledge and conversation type experience would bring to someone which is it, it became a seed that they then worked with and externalized and built a life around he had to take that material that came through in the red book not go crazy recognize there was something he could do with this material integrate it into his professional life and build his world around it and in doing so obviously became the fullness of who he was and, and what he brought to, to humanity. So if each of us has an experience like that, usually through a lot of hard work and introspection and, and failure, um, and we take that and trust ourselves and trust that vision 
to carry us forward into the fullness of who we can be, then this world would be a better place uh, exponentially. So I, I, I love that we finally have the Red Book and that we've learned uh, th through Jung's example, um, I want to say learned, but more like confirmed that this idea of uh, inner truths conveyed into outer work um, is a valid concept. Well, it's interesting because, I mean, if you look at some of uh, some of uh, not, not necessarily psychiatrists or so, sorry, psychology, uh, psychologists, mm -hmm. um, you see that there is this kind of experience that you're talking about. I mean, you could say Crowley with the Book of the Law. You could say Robert Anton Wilson with his, uh, you know, his serious uh, experience. Mm -hmm. Philip K. Dick had a similar experience. Uh, do you think that there's this kind of like critical mass that happens with some people that and it kind of explodes out into a kind of uh, into a, like a masterwork almost like for example with Philip K. Dick he wrote his exegesis and Crowley is the book of the law Jung the red book and is it what, right. what do you think what do you think causes this kind of critical mass sort of happening with these people it's kind of uh, <laughs> it's, it's interesting uh, well uh, to me it it boils down to the way I see the uh, if you want to call it the doctrine of the HDA and how it works uh, itself, which is that the HDA is always, always whispering to us all the time, all our lives. And our task is not to go on some journey elsewhere to find it. It's to get our head in the right place where we can hear it. And this makes sense of the entire path. If you think of it this way, we're trying to refine our ability to tune into that particular radio station. That is the voice of the HGA and not those other stations that uh, are playing static or <laughs> playing something that's, that's not the right voice. So I think for all these individuals, their life circumstances and their inner preparedness uh, somehow got their head in the right place for this, uh, sort of channel of communication to happen yeah it's like they sort of all received a kind of intense transmission from something isn't it it's kind of uh, yeah it's 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 a really interesting kind of phenomena that seems to happen i mean it probably happens to people and we that we, you know we've never heard of but it just happens that these particular course, people that yeah. that i'm personally a fan of all seem to have this uh <laughs> these, these yeah you know, these uh powerful transmissions um right one thing to talk about with Jung, and again, I think this crosses over quite nicely with magic. With magic in general, is dreams and dream, um, dream magic, and the effects of dreams. Um, you know, I personally keep a dream diary, obviously, as part of my magical practices, and I, I find it an incredibly powerful tool. Could you talk a bit about dreams and uh, their, their kind of place in the magical practice? Mm -hmm. um, there's a chapter on dream work and I did a podcast episode on it in uh, Living Thelema so it's something I have thought about in the context of magicians um, but it crosses over with Jung as well doesn't it as, oh absolutely yeah the centerpiece of his of his therapeutic work involves dream analysis and um, you know the basic tenet there is that the unconscious that well, the, the entirety of the psyche uh, is motivated to move towards wholeness and self-awareness and balance. So dreams are in Jung's conception, a message from the unconscious about stuff we need to know, you know, stuff, energy that needs to move into consciousness in order for that balance and wholeness to occur. So you can easily see how this overlaps with what magicians would be doing in terms of the self-awareness component, um, the, uh, necessity of having psychological balance in order to have a uh, healthy management of all the energies we work with. And, um, in, uh, in my recommendation, my recommendations for magicians is to engage with dream work somehow, um, uh, as a part of their path. And the, the book that I often recommend for that, just so everyone hears it is, uh, Robert Johnson's book called inner work. He's a Jungian analyst is dead now, but, uh, uh, fantastic guidebook for that. That's, it's uh, set apart from all those hokey sort of dream encyclopedias where you just look up what your what your dream <laughs> contents are supposed to mean um this is much more uh, than the jungian tradition of allowing the 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 personal associations of the dreamer to shape the symbol system or to to grapple with the, the symbol system and uh, so i recommend that approach to everybody yeah it's definitely i mean do you think the magical keeping the um dream diary rather is is uh 
for me, I found it was it actually helped me to remember my dreams more, which is kind of strange. Oh yes. Um, yeah. why, why do you think that is? That's that kind of confused me a little bit, but it was it was a good thing. But it was a uh, well to anthropomorphize a little bit. Uh, I think the unconscious can tell we're listening, and gets encouraged by that. You know, so uh, or you can think of it as digging a well. You know, you you you've by by monitoring the dreams, you are opening up more of a accessible accessibility to the water, you know, that can flow up. And, and so the more you do it, the more that channel is solidified and, uh, readily available. But I, I definitely see that when, and myself and others, that when, when people are working with dreams, engaging with that unconscious directly, um, it gets easier and easier. And it seems dreams happen more, more readily and are remembered more readily. David, I'd really like to pick your brain about the shadow. It's the it's yeah. I mean, it's the weirdest subject there, right? It's something that uh, you know, for years I'll, I'll read it and I'll, I'll read about it and I'll kind of think I've wrapped my head around it, and then I'll stumble a, across something else that makes me realize, oh, I never knew what the hell the shadow was. <laughs> but this keeps happening over and over again. Um, you know, can, can can you talk about the shadow and I and also how it relates to magic and um, you know, uh, I guess like what shadow work would be, uh, what, what would that look like in a magical, uh, paradigm? Sure. Sure. Uh, so the, the shadow is, is defined more or less as the unacknowledged aspects of self. Uh, one way of thinking about this is that ties in with that metaphor of shadow is that it's where the light of self reflection doesn't shine. It's the, the shadow cast by what we are looking at, mm. but reveals what we're not looking at. <laughs> and, um, uh, the the idea of the practice is to make more of this unconscious content conscious by by investigating it. So um, one of the best ways to discover shadow material is through monitoring our psychological projections. That is when we are are um, at first unconsciously allowing our own predispositions and blind spots and unexplored aspects of self to color our perception of others. If, uh, if we're not feeling good about ourselves, we may project onto someone else that they don't like us, you know, but it, mm. if we're not conscious of that self-esteem issue, then the problem is in that other person. Right. But if we become conscious through reflection on that projection, wait, why am I so convinced they don't like me? Maybe I don't like me, you know, and that then there's an awareness that can increase there. So shadow work is largely about, um, increasing and perhaps entirely about self increasing self-awareness uh so that it isn't shadow anymore it's acknowledged and accepted uh and you can see how that process inherently leads towards wholeness when we're when we have a more inclusive approach to all that we are as opposed to segregating it into uh you know segregating it out of awareness now shadow material can also be positive so we uh, project all the awesome, wonderful things that, that we want to be onto someone else and to think that they're the mm. ones who are awesome and we could never be that, you know, Jung says there's gold in the shadow and that's one of the things he's getting at that there's, uh, it's just as likely that we've outsourced our, our inner majesty onto someone else. Uh, this often happens with our choice of romantic partners. You know, I, I, I will be complete when I have them and I'm only complete because I have them and, you know, that gets to be a mess. Wow. I've never thought about it in that way at all. That's really, that's really interesting. I mean, you often hear people, uh, I guess the refrain of it being, uh, like you said, gold, there's gold in the shadow or there's uh power in the shadow or something like that. But, um, that's really interesting. So uh, you project good things that you, is it good things that you want to be or good things that you're not recognizing about yourself or both? You know, um, okay. uh, those aspirations or those realities. Um, also, cultures have shadow, and we've seen the right. worst results of that across history. Um, uh, when a usually through a uh, um, charismatic leader with ill intentions, uh, we we see entire cultures decide that some other group is evil, and take action accordingly. So. The entire culture sort of projects it's they're the bad guys, not us, you know, onto this other group. And, uh, you know, disaster ensues. 
So what is the Thalamic version of the shadow and, and how would, what would that shadow work look like? Right. So, um, sometimes that can be explicit. Um, well, I'll give you one example of it in, in the AA track. There is a phase at the, the neophyte grade of the order where the central inner task of the initiate is to become competent in, um, working in their body of light. In other words, scrum. Uh, astral projection and so on and uh, the final culminating task of that whole process is a scrying of the the clipothic realm of their natal sun sign so to go to that place that represents the uh, darkest dreariest most malign aspects of their personality and see what that astral realm looks like, you know? So it's, it's not hard to see this as some, some shadow work put in terms of, uh, of ritual experience and scrying. Scrying. How, how so scrying? Um, but well, you would, you would, uh, design a customized ritual to invoke, the essence of the the clipothic realm you're wanting to explore and then in that environment do a scrying session mm. by whatever means works for you so it's it's a conscious encounter with with that particular shadow material um, and people get some pretty amazing stuff out of it right that's you know that, i mean i'm i don't know if you're into psychedelics at all but uh, i've always felt... i've heard of those <laughs> i've always felt, um i'm like uh, like last year in particular, me and uh, my wife were eating a lot of mushrooms all the time, like every weekend. And uh, I'd say every fourth or fifth trip was terrible for me. Just terrible. They were awful. <laughs> Very uncomfortable. <laughs> Why don't you <laughs> but, skip that day? Well, I yeah, right? <laughs> I tried that. It didn't work. Um, it just caught up with me the next week. Uh, the, the, th the thing was, though, is I walked away and I, I really honestly felt like those were the best ones. Those were the most memorable ones. And those were the ones where I really felt like I did something. You know what I mean? Learn, learn the most, maybe. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Because they were it wasn't I wasn't distracted by by having fun. You know, <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting. The, yes. The clip off is like a it's it's the kind of the dark side of the tree of life in a way, isn't it? It's um, and uh, I was reading a book by what's his name? Thomas Carlson about the clip off and he was saying that actually by delving into these kind of dark sides of you know um of of your psyche that you actually often find the best information would you say that was something you agree with or i i think it is uh some of the most vital information uh that we discovered there to give an example of the way a clipothic realm could relate to something uh on the tree of life the uh the nature of Teferis, for example, the central sphere on the tree is of spiritual awakening and centeredness and, you know, that sort of uh, spiritually plugged in uh, structure, ego structure of the adept. So uh, awakened consciousness. Um, the clipothic way of conceiving of that way of conceiving of the clipothic aspect of that would be spiritual vanity and uh, lack of genuineness of self and. Uh, you know, sort of twisting the idea of I have attained spiritual awakening to, haha, I've, it's mine, you know, I'm, I'm the, the master of, of all and I've got this wisdom and, you know, everyone should bow before me. So the, uh, the, the, the dark side of any, um, power we gain, you know, there, there's going to be a dark side of any power we gain of any, any positive attribute that we have could be taken too far or, uh, directed toward the wrong ends that take us away from true will or such. So um, I just wanted to give that example. Yeah. Would you say, could you perhaps, because I've realized we've been talking about this and not really kind of clarified what it is for someone who doesn't, can you talk about what the clip off actually is? Uh, the idea is that these are shells of ideas that are, uh, you know, and I realize this is, I'm putting some psychological spin on this, but, uh, we can think of it as, as old and outworn ideas that have, that are clinging to, uh, an attempt to be relevant <laughs> to us. So, um, or aspects of self that 
we aren't necessarily feeding consciously anymore, but they're, they still have a hold on us and, and kind of pull us down at times. So, uh, you know, in terms of the, the Kabbalah and the, and the tree of life, one way of thinking of this is the, the sort of the, uh, the underside of each of the aspects of self represented by the tree of life, by the Sephiroth. Awesome. David, it's been great having you on. Um, and I, we definitely want to have you back on because I feel we've only really scratched the surface of, of, what, we, <laughs> of what we could talk to you about. Um, uh, I, I would highly recommend anyone listening to pick up, especially those looking to um, follow a Philemic path, um, to pick up the book Living Philema, which is it's just the it's it's like a it's like a guidebook essentially isn't it to how to become a thelemite in many ways it's um it's that's a, a yeah. that fits <laughs> yeah and then yeah. see the winds of wisdom have you got any 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 other book projects on on the horizon or yeah uh, well books and and some other projects thanks for asking I, i'll kind of shout out for a couple of things here um first of all book wise the most recent thing i i put out was co-edited with uh, lon milo duquette who we've mentioned a couple times here um and it's uh, Llewellyn's complete book of ceremonial magic out in February, last February. And um, uh, it is uh, an anthology of writings. Uh, each chapter is a, an entirely different tradition within Western ceremonial magic written by an expert of that tradition. Uh, and Lon and I co-edited this uh, together. And uh, it's a... Um, I... I, I I'm getting good feedback on it. I, I'm pretty proud of it. And I think we, we did a nice job of, of letting these amazing writers and thinkers put their voice onto, you know, their respective traditions. Um, I've co-edited a lot of archival publications, uh, the, the writings of Sora Merrill, Phyllis Seckler, who was my teacher in AA, uh, and also of her teachers, Jane Wolf and Carl Germer, uh, some diaries and correspondence. Um, Jane Wolfe's diaries from her time at the Abbey of Thelema and Chefalu. All of these are published through Temple of the Silver Star. Um, in terms of uh, some upcoming important events, we have uh, organized the LimaCon, which is this year going to be an online conference that's open to the public. Anyone interested in Thelema um, can register if you go to thelimacon.org. Um, if you want to find out more about uh, the Living Thelema podcast, that's available any, anywhere where you subscribe to podcasts, but also there's a YouTube channel for Living Thelema, and you can go to livingthelema.com. And finally, if you're interested in, in uh, formal training and the things that I've been talking about today, you can reach the AA at onestarinsight.org and the Temple of the Silver Star at totss.org. So I wanted to put that out there. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for coming on, and uh, like we'll have to get you back on sooner rather than later, I think. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. We like... Would love to come back. Thank you for having me. Excellent. Thanks a lot, man. And we're back. We're, I'm bringing back this outro thing, definitely, because we, we used to do this in the old show, and I, um, I had some comments from people saying you just cut after the interview, and blah blah blah. Yeah, we should we should have an outro, really. I mean, most podcasts do. Um, I mean, usually I'm peeing right now, but yeah, I guess I can hold it. So, what did you think of Mr. Dave, uh, Doctor <laughs> David Shoemaker? <laughs> doctor, God, man, uh, I thought he was he was awesome. He's so well spoken, and um, he has. He's uh he's really clear about some subjects that I feel like people tend to be um, mysterious about. <laughs> it's really interesting having a Jungian swing on it as well. I really like that. It's great. It makes sense. It's it totally makes sense, and I don't understand why there's not more of that. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, um, we'll be back next week. Um, I'm not sure who we're, but it'll either be with Alan Greenfield or Sarah Janes, the two guests mm. coming up. Um, so one of the two and yeah like i said earlier on in the show if you're you know if you're in any way a fan of what we do just uh, drop us a, a review on itunes or you know, just hit subscribe come visit us on youtube 
Um, you know, we're basically everywhere. We're on Alexa Tune In now, apparently. Um, and I what is? I don't even know what that is. What is that? I have no idea either. It was a service. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, yep, yeah, we'll All sign right. up for that. <laughs> okay, cool. <laughs> um, we're also hoping to do some collabs with potentially some other podcasts, um, which I haven't mm. told Josh about yet. So I'll, uh, I'll, um, I'll. Uh, I'm mystified and surprised. Yeah, there you go. Anyway, thanks for listening. I really, uh, I really enjoying being back, um, doing this again. Um, it's you know, it's, it was a big project of mine back in the day, and it feels nice to be back and swing in again. So, um, like, like I said, subscribe, check us out, check out the old episodes. If you go to oh, that's another thing I should say as well. If you go to sittingnow.co.uk, which is our, you know, our, our main hub. Um, you can listen to all of our previous episodes there and there's you know write-ups and i'm slowly we did a bunch of other podcasts and i'm slowly uploading those mm-hmm. to uh to um archive.org so we've, we've got i think all of coincidence control network which is a kind of weekly news show that josh was part of as well um all of those are up i think now and i'm gonna how many of those did we do 97 episodes i believe so oh so close did we start that oh that's terrible i know we got so just terrible um so <laughs> I'm going to figure out a way of linking those episodes back up to the posts on the website so we'll have a listenable archive of, uh, of, of Coincidence Control Network and our music show uh, Behind Beautiful. Closed Doors. So um, getting it all up there, it's just bear with us. It's a big old process putting the site back up. Um, so we're, we're, we're slowly getting there. Um, but yeah, so we'll see you next week.